interactive and more dialogue than monologue for me. Uh, so really, like, when I get going, uh, I really don't want to go very long. I'm really here to sort of answer real questions about the business, where we are, where we've been, where we're going. And uh, suffice to say, it's a, as, uh, it, it will be on my tombstone that uh, it is the world's greatest job in the world's worst business. Uh, and, and we're seeing that uh, today because there are just there are a lot of great people that, uh, that are not going to be working and not going to be working because of forces completely out of their control. And uh, you know, that a lot of times can simply be uh, a, pro a program director who changes and you know, one guy loves you, the other guy hates you. Or it could be simply a, you know, a bean counter in a far off place who's saying, yeah, we don't need that guy anymore, slash him. And uh, you know, because we, we, we've got to get, you know, we've got to get to a number that our parent company can be happy with, and uh, that we can make a return on uh, stockholders' investments. And that's you know, basically where radio has gone uh, over the last 30 years. Uh, really, it began in the in the mid 80s with uh, uh, with uh, what they would call leverage buyouts, where uh, a lot of companies were uh, were bought uh, with uh, with bad money and. Uh, Basically, uh, huge loans that could not be repaid. Uh, it uh, accelerated uh, when President Clinton uh, signed the uh, Telecommun uh, Telecommunications Act of 1996, uh, which basically allowed uh, made companies to hold more than what they used to be able to hold in any individual market. It used to be that you could hold a television station, a radio station, uh, and a newspaper uh, in the same market. The, Telecom Act of 96 changed all that to where you could own up to, I believe it's seven, it's seven radio stations, no any market, and television. And so it just, it really consolidated the market and it made it much more of a uh, bean counter industry as opposed to an art industry. Um, mom, and pop, mom and pop is unfair, but uh, where uh, the, the product did not become the bottom line. The product, you know, the, the product should generate sales. Uh, as opposed to, you know, we, we've got to sell this in order to make this number. So from just that beginning, uh, I will say I was uh, I went to the University of Florida. I graduated with a degree, degree in uh, telecommunications in 1981. Um, it was not uh, the degree that I wanted. I wanted to have a, a double major in history and political science, but in order to work at the College of Journalism and Communications in Florida, you had to be enrolled in the college. Uh, so I did. Uh, I worked, uh, my, actually even before I got there, I was a student manager for the Florida basketball team my first two years. Uh, I, I've always loved basketball. I always figured that at some point, you know, I would get into it on, on some level. I didn't know exactly where, um, but I thought that uh, being a part of that would uh, help my understanding of the game and, and, and uh, increase my love for the game, and, uh, and it absolutely did. And it was, it was invaluable to me. Uh, so, uh, I worked uh, at the, the radio station in Florida, was a fully commercial radio station, owned by the university, but uh, had a full-time general manager, full-time sales staff, uh, but the kids did all, just about all of the work, all the uh, DJing, all the sportscasts, newscasts, everything that went along with it. It was a fantastic laboratory. Um, my friend Larry Patel and I began the, uh, the sports program there um, my senior year uh, in the fall of 1980 uh, to where you know, basically we, we did high school games on Friday night. Uh, I wound up doing uh, Florida women's basketball. I did a lot of baseball uh, at that time as well. Uh, and so, you know, I was, I was in great shape, I thought. And then I got out of school and realized that, you know, you, no matter how talented you think you are at 21 years old, that, uh, uh, you know, the top five market isn't necessarily banging down, uh, you know, trying to hire you unless you're Bob Costas. And you're that good, um, but uh, so I went. I was uh, I went home to New York. Uh, I was out of work for about six months, and then I went to work for an outfit called Sports Loan, which uh, back in the day, and literally back in the day, because it doesn't exist anymore. This is before the internet. This is how uh, gamblers and fans got their got their scores: nine seven six one three one three. 58, 58 seconds. I could do twenty six scores in fifty eight seconds. You had to listen really closely. Uh, but it was everything that radio was, uh, with the exception of my message was going through the phone, as opposed to going out over the air. I mean, we we reported, we covered games, 
went to locker rooms, got tape, came back, cut that tape, uh, and that two-year uh, experience really set the stage so that when I was hired by KRLD in 1984 to move to Dallas, uh, I was in a great position because nobody here was really covering games for the, for the national networks who wanted sound, or at least they didn't have anybody they could really trust, but they knew they could trust me to do that. And uh, I wasn't being paid a whole lot of money at KRLD at that time. Uh, so it was, uh, it was nice to be able to get my beer money. And that's how I got my beer money. And basically, I, I covered Mavericks, Rangers, uh, Cowboys, uh, you know, just about every game that I could possibly cover, I covered. Um, and so that's basically how I got you know, the ability to, to report and to go out and, uh, and meet people and uh, get them you know, on some level to trust me. And, you know, even I'll never forget my first uh, my first week at Carroll D. Uh, we had the Cowboys at that time. Uh, you know, we were at the Cowboys station. So uh, Brad Sham had hired me, and Brad Sham told me you need to go to the Cowboys offices. And at that time, the Cowboys offices were on Central Expressway um, and uh, and Yale, basically, like 6166 North Central Expressway. So I go into their office, and uh, I meet their PR directors uh, at the time, Doug Todd and Greg Aiello, who Greg, Greg is still working for the NFL. Um, and they hand me an envelope, <laughs> and inside that envelope is the name, or the names and addresses and phone numbers, again, for the era of cell phones, of every Cowboys official, including Tom Landry and Dan White and, you know, Tony Dorsett and Ed Jones and, and whoever. And so, I mean, and so you, you don't get that kind of access now, and people, uh, the teams are much more circumspect with it just because it's so, um, you know, it's, it's, there, there's so many more people trying to do what we did at that time. And, you know, I, I don't want to spend too much time on good old Dave syndrome, but I do think that that was a better time, uh, you know, where, as opposed to, the, I mean, if you go out to the star, <coughs> excuse me, and the Cowboys are, you know, in there uh, in, in a game week and you're going there on Wednesday, you know, during the, the media time, and you'll, there, will, there will be, uh, basically, 20 of you for every player that makes himself available. Which, and you know, this whole we'll make ourselves available one day a week to talk is just nonsense. But that's just another time. But I always wanted to do play by play. That was that was my thing uh, from the time that I was basically 10 years old and had a radio uh, under my pillow at night to be able to listen to Marv Albert and listen to the Knicks and the Rangers and you know, Merle Harmon do the Jets and Bob Murphy and Linton Nelson do the Mets. Uh, you know, those who don't do the Yankees, whoever. That I pretty much knew that that's what I wanted to do, um, and just as a overarching theme to this, whatever you decide that you want to do, whether it's me, what, what I do, or whether it's in marketing, communications, or sales, or whatever, whatever it is. Uh, you need to make sure that every morning you're waking up and you're saying, I love this job. Because in so many ways, it, while you don't want the job to define who you are, the fact is you spend more time on your job than you basically do at anything else that you do. So you better like it. And really, more importantly, you better love it. And for me, I knew very early on that that's what I wanted to do. And I needed to find a way to work my way into it. And so. Uh, you know, I was lucky enough uh, that uh, uh, KRLD had the rights to TCU football uh, back in the 80s, and so I got to do some games there. I did their basketball, which is where I, for lack of, of a better phrase, sort of developed my, my reputation ultimately where uh, I, I was going to wind up uh, several years later. Uh, but I did that, and then uh, I started doing national games in 1991 for, for CBS Radio, which then was uh, later became less than one. Uh, for, uh, for football and basketball. I did another stint with TCU, but I did A&M, and I did Little Texas, a little SMU, uh, and you know, I was just very fortunate to be in places where I had the chance uh, to you know, get, get reps and make sure I could uh, do well enough that people would want to hire me. Uh, so uh, I was at Carroll for eight years, uh, and then I got fired. Uh, Program director changed. Program director wanted to change the focus of the radio station, which uh, had been very, it was a new, it was an old, Carol, it was all news. 
uh, but it had a, a heavy sports influence, but they had lost the Cowboys. Uh, I thought that we could still compete on that level and succeed on that level. They brought in a guy you know, who definitely didn't agree with me. We clashed. He's the boss. He fired me. And suffice to say that you have not lived until you've been fired. Uh, and if you get into the media business on any level, at some point you will be fired. I mean, and again, as we said here at the beginning, not necessarily because you're not talented uh, or you're not doing things right, but it may be that you know, your, one program director loves you, another guy hates you. It's, and it can just be as simple as that. Uh, and then you just have to be able to you know, persevere and believe in yourself and know that you know, what you're doing is right. And uh, I was fortunate two weeks later, I got hired in Philadelphia. Uh, I wasn't thrilled to move. I really didn't want to move. Uh, I love Dallas, love living in Dallas. Uh, but uh, the chance to host my own show, which I had not done to that point, other than doing Cowboys uh, pre- and post-game shows, uh, was really appealing to me. And obviously, Philadelphia was a fantastic sports town. Uh, I was there 16 months, and then a uh, little station called the Ticket decided that uh, they were going to get into operation. And uh, I, got, I got a call uh, and said, would you like to come back? And it took me about you know, three-tenths of a second to say yes, because that's what I wanted to do. I, I wanted to be in Dallas doing talk. And so basically from uh, January 1994 to now, uh, I've been here. I was at the ticket until 1997. Uh, I got fired there because again, program director changed and didn't like my style versus what he wanted the style of the radio station to sound like. Uh, so I went to WBAP. I did the night shows, uh, including uh, stars pre and post, uh, and uh, even got a chance to fill in on some stars radio when Daryl Ray was off doing stuff, and I got to work with Ralph Strangis, and uh, you know, it was, uh, was around for the Cup when they won in 1999, and got to the finals in 2000, and lost to the Devils in six games. It was, it was an incredible experience, just be able to be a part of that. It was a four-hour show, uh, eight to midnight, by myself, very difficult, but, uh, but, I, love, but I, I love the challenge of being able to do it. But uh, for me, the business has changed quite a bit uh, to the point where we are much less caller driven. I mean, if you're listening to sports talk radio at all, there really isn't a whole lot of callers. There's a whole, there is a lot of talk, but there's not a lot of callers. Uh, some of that is justifiable because there can be a bunch of callers who are idiots. Uh, but at the same time, if you have a great producer who can you know, really screen the callers heavily to find out what, you know, what do you really want to talk about, it can really be quite energizing. Uh, but since most shows now are multiple voice shows, there, there are very few people who work alone at all. Uh, they, they feel as long as there's talk back and forth that you don't need the, the caller. Uh, I don't always agree with that because I, I don't want my callers to be, uh, to, to feel as if we're just background noise. Uh, I want our, call, our, our listeners to feel like that they can be engaged in something larger. And also, uh, you know, frankly, my strengths have always been in my diversity that I can pretty much talk about anything. And pretty much talk about anything and, uh, and, and do it with some authority. Uh, a lot of people can't do that. And so, you, as you've noticed, uh, if there's a, you know, a three, hour, three hour talk show, you know, there's gonna be a whole lot of football, maybe a little basketball, maybe a little baseball, but uh, anything out, you know, outside of that and, and really trying to keep it as local as possible, which on one level is fine, but on another level, you know, really doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't show the, the breadth of knowledge that, that, your, uh, that your host should be capable of providing. Uh, so from that standpoint, I'm not, you know, I have to do some radio now, and now the Mavericks are done. Um, to be honest, I really don't like it very much anymore. Um, and maybe I'm just jaded because I've done it for a long time, but, uh, but I just don't like where, we, where we've gone. Uh, in that time. But to me, there's nothing like being at the game. That, that, that's the whole reason for feeling the way I do and loving sports the way I do was, it, and the goal was never to sit in a, in a room with four walls and microphones and just opine. It was to basically, again, since I want to be a history major, it's being part of history. It's being able to record, uh, describe history as it's happened. And obviously, you know, when the Mavericks won in 2011, uh, to be able to do that was just, it was the most extraordinary professional moment of my life. Uh, to be able to describe that and hopefully get the call that, you know, you, 
go on to Google and you go on to YouTube and you check out Mavs 2011 championship and you hear how I described how the Mavericks won it, um, you know, it's there forever. And, uh, and in radio, you know, there are no editors. In live radio, there are no editors. You get one chance to get it right. And so I was, I was really proud of that. And it's, it's something that I, I don't take lightly at all, especially with, you know, our team and, and Dirk and uh, do, him doing uh, what he's done and, uh, this last year, passing 30,000 points. And, uh, you know, the build up to that and on that night against the Lakers, and just knowing that this just might happen tonight, that, you know, that you've really got to be on it. And, you know, even thinking about it now, I'm getting goosebumps talking about it. It's just, it's, it's incredibly, it was an incredibly special night in an otherwise terrible season. But, uh, but that, that's the type of thing that really appealed to me. But, uh, you know, the bottom line ultimately is you've got to do what you love. Find a way to do what you love. Uh, and if you do that, then you're, you're going to be happy. Um, I think uh, Leon wanted to mention about uh, internships. and uh, You know, the, the business has changed so much. Again, going back to where we were at the beginning, with ESPN cutting as much as they were cutting. You know, back in the day, you know, a 21-year-old, uh, really inexperienced person working in a top five market could never happen would never, ever happen. But now, because the business has changed, and everybody's trying to do it, frankly, for less money, uh, you know, and there is a lot of people who certainly would have no problems saying, you know what, I can do that job, I want to do that job, that uh, uh, a 21-year-old, if he's in the right place, and just uh, doing his thing and hanging around, uh, you know, he's, he's going to get a chance. And you know, I'll, My son uh, is an example of this now, I did not do very much to get my son uh, in his position at ESPN. He actually had been, he had a relationship with, uh, with a couple of the producers there you know, that was really outside of me, and uh, they wanted him to come on board and do something. Uh, and so starting last summer, you know, he did. And uh, you know, internships have changed too because uh, you, have, you, you cannot have an, un, an unpaid internship anymore uh, for things that could normally be done in the course of business. Uh, the, the, law, the labor laws have changed so that people have to pay you. So in, in the case of my son, my son basically is an intern, but he gets paid about 10 to 12 hours a week uh, while he's in school right now. Well, that's, that. you know, again, everybody likes having a little bit of money in their pocket, so that gets everybody pretty excited about that. And you know, Jeffrey's worked on the weekends, uh, primarily running, running the, uh, the audio board but those people also have to do the morning sports centers. So he's doing six sports centers a morning, and he's, and so now he's building up a, a little resume tape for him to be able to, you know, if he wants to stay in that business, that's great, and if he doesn't, well, you know, there's, uh, there are other avenues for him to go to, uh, and let's face it, the way the business also is going, uh, as much as you want to be able to just simply write, or you want to simply be able to be on the radio, or you don't like those and you want to be on television. The fact is you've got to be able to do all three. You've got to, you've got to be versatile now because uh, companies are looking for the ultimate return on their investment. And if, if you can't do all of that stuff, then they're going to find people who can. So uh, I would strongly suggest uh, being as, as versatile as you possibly can. And as, you know, just, you know, do you need a, a telecommunications a broadcast degree? Clearly not. I mean, Again, I, I have it only because that was my way to work at the radio station. I really wanted to do that. But the way the business has gone now, uh, you know, a history major is great, an English major is great, a Russian major is great, uh, you know, a biology degree is great. Uh, you know, any, anything that ha allows your mind to be as well-rounded as it could possibly be uh, is really uh, quite preferable. Uh, it'll, it'll make you far more marketable so that when you actually are talking on the air, you can talk about a lot of things instead of just one thing. Bro frankly, uh, broadcast classes, uh, certainly back in my day, I don't know that they've changed a whole lot, uh, really, really don't matter. They, they really, they, it's a whole bunch of theory that has very little uh, relationship to the practicality that's necessary once you're out in the real world. Uh, your real world experience is, is much more important. And now with, uh, you know, with iPads, and, Know, all the technology that exists right now. You know, if you want to be a play-by-play -play guy, you want to do a Frisco Wakeland game, just you know, go find yourself somewhere in the press box uh, at the star and go sit down and you know, prepare like you're going to go do a game and just put it in your, your iPad and listen to it back, get some other people to listen to it, and give you some feedback. And 
you know, you're, you're pretty much on your way if, if indeed that's what you want to do. We did not have that much.